Are you going to have a chance to talk? Hey, got to get a shot. The mic is still. Tim, let's take that mic off. Criticize my manners. <laughs> 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 system and they include seven I believe of the statewide Tennessee teachers of the year so they know their stuff and they've heard I, maybe I'll sit down now and present you and let you begin the discussion with them and if at any point anyone wants me to jump in I will ladies and gentlemen we're honored to have the president of the United States come to Tennessee and say you're, you're doing a good job in public education we want to learn more about it that's quite a something for us we appreciate it well I want you to know that I admire the governor very much for the position that he's taken and even out in front of the commission's report. And so why don't we just, um, we have a rule in the cabinet room back there when we have working lunches sometimes that we can talk with our mouth full. <laughs> and, uh, I know that, I don't know just exactly how to start a subject other than that you must at some time or other maybe many times I've said to yourself, if I had a chance to ask him, <laughs> <laughs> now's your chance. Go ahead. <laughs> when vocational agriculture first came about. Since that time, teachers of vocational agriculture have been on a 12-month instructional basis. My question on the master teacher program contains two parts. Mr. Governor, if you want to comment on this, I would appreciate it. With the possible enactment of the master teacher program, how would my 12-month program be affected? And if I became a man... Where you're from, and it's always interesting to me to know how long you've taught. Okay. And what you teach, I think that's... I'm a vocational agriculture teacher at Doyle High School in Knox County System. I've taught six years. Most teachers have 10-month contracts, and one of the parts of our program have been incentive to pay and one to $7,000 increases that other teachers would be... We've got several months and plenty of time to figure that out. Uh, has that come up, Sue, uh, in your discussions with the evaluation? It will not affect the existing contracts. Uh, adversely, in which if that gentleman wants to become a master teacher, despite the fact that he is reading the proposal. Thank you. Well, that's right, Jay. That's a better answer than I gave, which is why he was the teacher of the year in 1990. <laughs> Do you think it would be possible to provide clerical assistance 
to help relieve teachers of some details so that he or she can be active. Look, there's a lot of paperwork that you have to do now. The whole thing of ratio in classes, of course, uh, and we all know the importance of that. But I just wonder how uniform it is across the country because right now, and over the last several years, there are 200,000 more teachers in the country for five million fewer pupils. We have gone through the, the baby boom and maybe this is, uh, this is not evenly distributed. There may be some uh, individual places where, where they have that. I, I don't know enough about teaching that profession to envision all of the things, but tell me, do teachers still have to take turns at uh, monitoring in the halls and so forth? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. Right. I have, I want to tell you about thing we did in California that actually was aimed at welfare reform. When I was governor, we had what was probably the most comprehensive reform of welfare that's ever been attempted. And it was tremendously successful. And it didn't throw any hungry people out into the snow at all. As a matter of fact, when it was completed, we were able to increase the grants to the truly needy by 43%. The thing is, in welfare, no one in this country knows how many people are actually on welfare. They only know how many checks they're sending out. And you'd be surprised how many people, when our reform started, just disappeared. In other words, they were paper people. They were collecting it more than, than once. But one of the things we did, an experiment, and the federal government at the time wouldn't let us do it for the whole state, so they let us do it for 35 counties, but they wouldn't let us do it for a big county like Los Angeles. We notified the people in welfare who were able-bodied and, and avoiding, of course, say a mother with small children at home. And so forth. But we had school boards, we had county governments, we had local governments, every level of government submit to us things that, as we put it, we said, are there things you would be doing if you had the manpower and the money? Tell us what they are. And then we threw out anything because we're boondoggles. And what we said was, we have the manpower and the money. And in these 35 counties, we were allowed to make able-bodied welfare recipients work at community tasks of these kind that we had approved in return for their welfare grant. Now, we only made them work 20 hours a week, not 40. And at the same time, we then assigned what we call job agents, people from our state labor department, would give them a list of these as clients and say, now, you have an opportunity to see them, what they're doing, where they're working, and to see how quickly you can get them into private enterprise jobs. And in the midst of the 70, 1974 recession, we funneled 76,000 people into private enterprise jobs and permanently no longer dependent on welfare. But many of those jobs were that same kind. Able-bodied people that certainly could go out at a recess and be there in the playground, that could monitor in the corridors, could do things of this kind, and all those kinds of jobs that you're talking about. Now, maybe there are some you're talking about that are too technical, but I know in Los, East Los Angeles, where we have the great Latin, Spanish-speaking section of the city. And we've had a, a terrible problem of students being shoved into classes for the retarded when their only problem is speaking Spanish at home. They would lose out on something in the classroom only because of the language difficulty. And I had talked to mothers in that area who were complaining about it. And I said to the mothers, well, why don't you volunteer that you could be like a teacher's aide and in a classroom where there are a number of children of that kind and you could be the one speaking Spanish to be able to find out from the child what the difficulty is. Is it language or is it lack of intelligence? And the mothers at that time told me that under the regulations in California, 
they wouldn't be allowed. They couldn't be in the classroom unless they were certified teachers. And uh, I never did, did, never was able to get anything done about that. But I, I think that there are ways uh, that this should be done. And yes, this should be a part of the reward of a teacher, that if their work is being cluttered up with something that can be done at a lesser level, uh, I'd like to see that done too. I will answer every question. Our language classes are so small that we can't afford them. You see, it can work the other way around, uh, where if you only have to come in and say, oh, everyone is absent, let's do nothing today, that kind of thing. So that uh, you, you want to have a sizable class, it doesn't hurt, but I, of course, I'm not talking about 30 and 35. So that, generally speaking, our classes tend to be uh, small these days. But I, if I may, uh, Governor Alexander, say something else. I am just show how important education is, and uh, I hope that you will make your governor as well uh, a prophet in his own land, uh, because what he is undertaking is, is monumental to America. We, we just can't have uneducated Americans when so much of the world's burdens are on our shoulders. We need someone who knows how to handle this, and I hope that I was not out of line in, in, in saying what I said. I'm just very moved by you being here today and the president and the governor. Well, may I say that maybe part of my being here is because I've lived with a sense of guilt for so many years that maybe I didn't do as well as I should in school. <laughs> <laughs> man who can teach us 10 languages. Uh, I asked him a little while ago, my great curiosity is, does he think in those languages <laughs> or automatically translate like many of us would? No, he thinks in those languages too. This is a hard for me to comprehend. But the well, I'm excited about the master teacher plan because it will give me prestige and I will be able to before, as a teacher, you, there was no way, if you wanted to advance, you had to leave the profession or go into administration or supervision. That was your only way out. I like the idea of making more money. I like the idea of choosing how many months I'd like to work. Um, and I, I definitely, how my ability as a teacher is going to be measured. That's my main concern. Well, I know my first thought is, by your peers, that you grade students, you ought to be able to grade each other. But maybe, uh, maybe you'd like to, to answer that more specifically. That's a good question, and I'm hoping that as teachers we don't suddenly lose the perspective of our job every day because we make probably five or 6,000 decisions every day that affect the lives of youngsters probably for the rest of their lives and for generations to come. That's the role that we've been in. And even with youngsters, and I'm sure that if I went right through this school and I'd ask the youngsters, name me the best teachers in the school, I'd be willing to bet my whole paycheck for a year, they would be able to pick out the best teacher in the school. They could also pick out the second best teacher. And they could also pick out the worst teacher. And I'm judging that your judgment is far better than theirs. Uh, we know and I use basketball and sports quite a bit. I'm sure that most of the country knows how good Dr. J is. And they know that he's better than Crosby, <laughs> if you want to make a comparison. I think that by and large, we would have to look at a system in which your peers are involved, not totally. I think the, the principal has been a teacher, the supervisor has been a teacher, and these people would be involved in it. So it would be a committee of people who are also knowledgeable they're knowledgeable in terms of subject content, they're knowledgeable in terms of behavior and professional attitude. And this may be a little bit off. I'm not adverse to even having students involved in the process. But I think people judge people. And that's the reason why we're considered, you know, one of the highest species on this planet is because we have the brain and we're capable of altering our own environment but we're also capable of training each other. Because my concern there was, I saw mentioned test scores and the students maybe one way, and uh, that would mean the higher economic schools would have more master teachers because
Well, but not if, not if, uh, if I could interrupt to that point, and then, uh, not if you were the comment about this teacher and why they were ready to storm the ramparts uh, if he left. And all the terms were so wonderful. Well, he made learning exciting. And he, he saw these kids, he said, how could anyone to get rid of this teacher? Of course, I'm a little sensitive about retirement. <laughs> 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 yeah, this man, even in terms of tests, and I think this is something we have to look at, and this may be the greatest fear that many teachers have. We still will have to look at where we pick the youngster up and where we turn them loose. When we look, even the part of the commission, which is the president commission, we looked at schools, and if you don't mind if I use a couple of names, we looked at Harvard, which is one of the top, consider one of the top schools in the country, but they accept only the top kids in the country. And we looked at another, which was Boston, which accepted youngsters at a much lower level, but Boston did far more for the students that it took in so that you could see a much greater growth pattern than did Harvard. And I think that is something we have to look at in this process. If you get a, a J who came in reading at fourth level, fourth grade level, and in eight or nine years you got him mastering 10 languages and the teacher of the year, you probably got much more for James than you got a person reading at the 13th grade and he only made one month progress with it. So somehow or another we still have to, as Governor Alexander said, bring this into focus. We can't throw it out. But we must look at where you started with the youngster and where you turned them loose. Because if you started with them at the top and you made no progress with them, I'd be one of the first one to say you're an ineffective and an incompetent teacher. And it would take us several years to go through the evaluations to get there. And, and so it, it, it would be a while before anyone met the qualifications and they would get the title, but there might not be a job for them. The other answer to that is there in, in an entire school system, maybe maybe you don't need every you, know, you don't need every this and the answer to that. It just seems to me that teaching has been one of the few things in the United States that it is a profession where uh, someone would have it laid out that you could look at head from the beginning of the teaching and see that uh, that's the scale and that's all there is for you and your entire career. Well, that isn't good enough. It isn't good enough to get the right kind of people that you all want as teachers and to go into that. That's the reason why industry can raid uh, the schools and take the uh, teachers out. One of the things, incidentally, that we're trying and it's out of it reporting, you'd be surprised how successful it is already, just having heard of it, are, are having groups or businesses adopt schools and be able not only to help financially, they're doing this, it's sweeping the country, but to bring the outside into the school, that you can call on people who can come in and tell young people what a certain industry is like or what the job market out here, what the opportunities are, and so forth. And I think that this is going to be an important part that can meet, help meet some of these these problems. And I know I should stick with uh, Max. Earlier, we were talking on the, we were talking about, I called that young man in Chicago, who's on television, I'm sure you all saw him. He was a basketball star at Great University, couldn't read or write. And I know his story. And that he's a fine young man, and just talking to him, I just did that with a real ambition. And he wanted an education, but he was six feet five in junior high. So you know what happened, he was a basketball player. Well, they got him out of junior high without his ever learning to read or write. They put him through four years of high school, or I mean two years of the senior, throughout his four years for basketball, taking these set up courses and so forth with this knowledge, and I thought, what, what a terrible denigration of a profession and an important institution of education from down there at that grade on up, that any young man or woman could be exploited in this, in this way. 
And it's the same as the mother who said to me one day when I was kind of touring some minority neighborhoods in California without the knowledge of the press because I wanted to find out facts. <laughs> and this woman said to me, she said, don't talk to me about some of these things of where my child should go or not. She said, keep our children in the class they're in till they know what they're supposed to know in that class before you move them on. Don't move them just because they come to the end of the year. And she said, I have a son who's a high school graduate and can't read his diploma. And uh, this is one of the reasons for the commission. I have the unpleasant, well, very unpleasant don't, job. Don't do it just yet, because I just want to tell a short story. <laughs> I hate to do it at all. <laughs> I was saving this for our guest. <laughs> here at the end. When I was going to high school, uh, languages were compulsory. I had to take two years of foreign language. So I wound up with two years of French. But the tragedy was then, the Midwest, those early days, you never dreamed you were ever going to use it. So it was just a compulsory thing you had to, to learn. And I've often thought since if only one could have ever told me what a thrill it would be in a foreign country to be able to meet them at least part way on their terms. <coughs> well, my first trip to France was in connection with making a movie. And uh, there were three of us in the car, an executive of the studio and his wife and myself coming to a little town where we were to have lunch. By this time, I'd found out that this English couple had never crossed the channel before, didn't know one word of French. So I'm trying to remember back all the way to my voice. <laughs> and as I begin to remember some of them, I pad my heart a little bit. I get kind of intrigued with the whole idea. <laughs> so we pull up by the gendarme in this little town. I want to tell him I'm very hungry and how to, where's the best cafe? So by this time, I was able to say, as I rolled down the window, pardon, monsieur, j'ai grand fan. Where am I at cafe? I'm very hungry. Where is the best cafe? And he told me. And my friend who was driving says, what did he say? I said, I have to slap <laughs> <laughs>
schools program for disruptive children but the most important part of that here's what the best teacher makes after 20 years about eighteen thousand dollars here's what they have to look forward to on, on the average here's what the worst teacher makes after 20 years the same thing thousand dollars that's for a 10-month contract then we would have different steps more to look forward to after three years professional teachers and the other opportunities that teachers would have so there's the problem 13 to 18 there's the solution 15 to 28 on the average a big jump that is 1986 87 <coughs> our goal for doing a good job teaching they can make a little more money for going into administration for going back to school but not for doing a good job at what they were hired to do and we're embarked in this country because of the change in in the status of women. My mother is here. She taught uh, for many years when she and uh, the other excellent teachers who I remember taught. was telling us how this was presented on stage um, and I thought it was most interesting. He said behind the stage there was a ramp, a graduated ramp. It's symbolic of the uh, prophecy that he's going to make, okay? So this, you have this child crowned with a tree in his hand or out, and take no care who chafes, who frets, or where conspirers are. Macbeth shall, Macduff, and of course this again is hired murderers, and these hired murderers get to Lady Macduff and her son. Bef no, it, at the very beginning. Okay. Do you, do you vision? Do you think she wants to just be queen then? Okay, uh, inform her, as soon as he had met the witches, he was very careful to inform her about what the witches had told him. Okay, well, you won't find a stopping place with me. How are you, Governor? Hello? Nice to see you. I'm Shirley Minot, and this is a class of seniors at Farragut High School, and we'd like to welcome you to our class. Some of these are seniors of the class of 83, and some of them, are, most of them, in fact, are seniors from the class of 84. So they're trying to get ahead with their curriculum. We're reading Macbeth, which I'm sure you're familiar with, and we've been talking about the relationship between Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, and talking about um, how that relationship has deteriorated over time. And we've been talking about the death of Lady Macbeth and uh, how she finally lost her mind. The students uh, by Friday of this week have some memory work that they can say to me for extra credit. Now, I'm, I used to require this, but I don't require it anymore because it's too strenuous for them. But most of them choose to get extra credit points for this. You will. Will you not get some extra credit points? Okay. So they have some lines that they can say to me. And we would be very pleased if, if we could get you to read some of these lines to us. I, I can find a place for my favorite passage. I don't know about theirs, but I wonder if I could get you to do that. Well, I was tipped off as to that you were going to ask me that and what your favorite passage was. You even know my favorite passage. And so I just have it on a piece of paper here in my pocket. <laughs> well, that's very good because I just happen to have it marked in my book with a note card, too, so I could be sure to find the place. We really would be pleased if you would. Well, I don't know whether I'm trying out for a part or not. Not uh, Well, yes, Macbeth, and I had, I studied Shakespeare in high school. Uh, it was required, uh, but it was well worthwhile. And as a matter of fact, I once played Shakespeare, but that was in college. 
we did Taming of the Shrew, but did it in modern costume. And uh, it was very successful. But this is Macbeth's lines when the word has been brought to him of the death of Lady Macbeth. And as you know, how the forces of evil had seized him because of his ambition, and then to the point that he was almost without feeling. And he said, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. I hope that none of you ever get that pessimistic or that cynical about life. I think that humankind is very important and their lives are not as futile as he would have us believe, but he'd done it unto himself. I'm not going to go on talking here because uh, I know we've only got a few minutes in the schedule that they have for us, but I was also told that you might have some questions. And I always feel that uh, you must have sometime or other said to yourselves, if I, if I could only ask him, I well, <laughs> go ahead and let's spend our time doing that if, if we can. You have some? Yes. Mr. President, um, I'd like to know what type of advice what type of advice do you have to offer for anyone who is having trouble getting through school? Advice, trouble in getting through school? Excuse me? Did you say get it, trouble? What type of advice would you have to offer for anyone who is having trouble getting through school? If they're having problems with their school. Ah, well, yes, I would because it is so important. And sometimes those troubles can come and go. And if you mean just troubles scholastically or then I'd seek help. I'd go to teachers and let them know how much you really want to make it and that you, uh, it isn't a case of being careless or not trying, but that you want to make it and I think you'd be surprised how much help you'll get. Mr. President, at our age, was the presidency a goal or did it just come about later in your life? That's a very funny thing. It wasn't a goal in any way. As a matter of fact, it's funny what life does to you. Uh, not too many years ago, uh, I would have been willing to bet uh, the house and farm and, <laughs> and everything that there was no way that I would ever aspire to public office. I was very happy in the career that I had in Hollywood and um, thought that that's, I've always believed that you pay your way, so taking advantage of the fact that I was a performer and thus recognized and so forth, I would campaign for people, candidates that I believed in, help at fundraisers and so forth, for causes that I believed in and thought there I was paying my way, I was doing what I should to return a little something for how good life had been to me. and. Uh, it really came about almost by accident. Uh, uh, the, I made a speech that was carried on nationwide television on behalf of the Goldwater candidacy in 64. And um, it attracted quite a bit of attention. And two years later, the election for governor in California, uh, the party had been torn to pieces by that 64 campaign. It was in a shambles. And they kept after me to run. And I, at first, just, you know, literally threw them out of the house and said, go away, don't bother me. And they kept on to the point that I, one night, Nancy and I, we found we couldn't sleep. We were saying, well, because they kept putting it on the basis that I was offered the only chance to win and to bring the party back together. Finally, we were saying to each other, well, could we live with ourselves if they're right and we're wrong? And finally gave in. And you know, I think the truth is that I gave in really thinking that it wouldn't go any farther than the election, and then, uh, <laughs> then I'd be free again. I was halfway through the election when I said, wait a minute, if I win, <laughs> I've got a four-year contract. How do you compare the education of today with the education when you went to school? 
Well, now, I've just been through a couple of panels, a meeting with teachers from all over Tennessee, and I've been in a panel that was just held here in your building on the, on the governor's program here for merit pay for teachers. Uh, so it's, you'll have to realize that I am talking about education somewhere else than here. But there has been a decline in the quality of education. But I hasten to say, I understand, and one of the reasons I'm here is I know that here, in this particular school, in much of Tennessee, uh, you have stayed ahead of the rest of the country. You have not suffered that decline that has been so apparent, particularly in some of our large city schools. But the difference that I have seen is that I think, frankly, and it's all our fault, I by ours, I mean uh, parents, uh, the rest of us that went along before you, I think we've tried to make it too easy for you. Uh, when I was going to school, for example, uh, English was required for four years, and mathematics was required for three years in high school. Science was required for at least two years. You had required courses. We, language was required. Uh, I took Latin and then two years of French uh, as required. And I think that we've dropped a lot of the required courses. And very frankly, I think that you need uh, someone requiring, because left to your choice now, you haven't had the experience to know that you might find an interest in a different direction, like me finding out this job that I just answered about instead of the one that I had. And uh, I think that this commission that we've had on excellence in education that has recommended a return to more required courses uh, and so forth is going to be a, a big help. Mr. President, I was just wondering, with all the problems our country has with unemployment, when I graduate from college, how hard is it going to be for me to find a job? When you graduate from college, well, I think all the signs of recovery are very much with us, and I think we'll have recovery long before then. But this is what's also important in your education now. I think we're in a period, we've been in these periods before, but in a period of change where some of the things that were legitimate jobs in the past are no longer going to exist. There's going to be a whole new era in high technology and so forth, and you should be prepared and, and ready for those jobs. But I am quite sure that recovery is going to come uh, long before then, and uh, there will be employment opportunities. As a matter of fact, you'd be surprised if you take a metropolitan, a big city newspaper, the Sunday edition, where they run all the, the classified ads, even today, with 10 million unemployed, so we're 10% unemployed, even today, you will find that those Sunday editions, the Washington paper, the New York papers, Pittsburgh, Los Angeles, you will find those papers will carry as many as 50 and 60 pages of help wanted ads. But when you read them, you realize that these are employers advertising for people, and the people that are presently unemployed do not have the skills and the training for those jobs. This is why what we're doing at the federal level, one of our programs is aimed at retraining for people who are unemployed in these new lines of work. So uh, there'll be jobs for you. Students, we have time for one more question. Oh dear. Scott? Like over the past 20 years or so, the Supreme Court has made several decisions concerning separation of church and state. And I wonder how you feel uh, about the direction that we appear to be heading in this, in this matter. Well, I happen to differ with the decision that took prayer out of schools. I don't think the, first, the, the, the Constitution says anything about, uh, it says right, quite to the contrary, that Congress shall make no laws uh, pertaining to religion, either establishing it or preventing the practice thereof. And we are still a nation under God. It says so on our coins. God we trust. Uh, it's over the, over the very hall of the Supreme Court. And uh, uh, I have been very interested and have been trying to promote, and am still trying to promote, its constitutional change, a constitutional amendment that will restore the right of prayer. Now that would be non-sectarian prayer, 
so that no one church is favored over another. And to those who don't believe, uh, uh, they would, it would be voluntary. They would, wouldn't have to participate. But um, I don't think that the Constitution ever meant to, it's meant to separate church and state so that we couldn't have an enforced state religion. Uh, I don't think it was ever meant to separate our government or our people and reli from religion. Could I take, there were, just there were three more hands up there. I know our fellows think is desperate. Suppose I, well there's four hands really, you. Okay, Mr. President, do you think that a woman could handle being president as far as her relations with the foreign diplomats, considering most of them are male? I think that a woman could handle being president. I have just come from a summit conference in which one of the star performers was Margaret Thatcher, the Prime Minister of England. And uh, of course you could. You know, Will Rogers, you've heard that name, great comedian and philosopher years ago, and not only appeared in the stage, but had a column in most of the newspapers in which he gave his little philosophical thoughts. He once said, that was many years ago, that women were going to keep on trying to be more and more like men until pretty soon they wouldn't know any more than the men do. <laughs> no, certainly, I, I think that, uh, I think you will all live to see the day when a woman will be president of the United States. Why not? Uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, oh. Teacher says I have to quit. <laughs> yeah. been, a great, been a great pleasure, and I wish that I could have made the answers shorter so that I could have taken all the, the rest of the questions there. But um, listen, stay with it and what you're doing here. It may sometimes seem as if it isn't very important, but. Uh, and you'll wonder why, but there's a reason for all of it. And uh, you'll look back, and I just told in there in the panel a little experience of my own. I once sat in a principal's office at about your stage of life, and the principal, for very good reason, said to me, I don't care what you think of me now. He said, I am more concerned with what you'll think of me 15 years from now. And 15 years later, I had the satisfaction and the real rewarding experience of facing him again and telling him, I understood now, 15 years later, what it was he was trying to do and thanking him uh, for what he was trying to do. So, uh, and stay with it. The students have Don't a give small up. gesture that they would like to make on behalf of the 2,300 students here at the high school.